Welcome to the Low Carb Athlete Podcast, where we focus on discussing topics to help you burn fat, optimize health, and improve performance in life and sports. Transform the whole you from the inside out with the holistic method. Let's dive in. Here's your host, Debbie Potts. All right, guys, here's the deal. I'm on a mission to help you learn how to match your fueling and training together, but also don't forget you can't out-exercise poor lifestyle habits and you cannot out-supplement poor nutrition habits. We talk a lot, or I do, about what you eat, but also when, how, and why. We want to be able to digest that food properly. We need to be in the parasympathetic nervous system state, rest and digest before we eat. So rushing and eating, you're in sympathetic. You're not going to digest. If you are doing 10 things at once, you're driving your car, you're just eating super fast, wolfing down your food, you're not getting those digestive enzymes. So no matter what you eat, if it's good, healthy, nutrient-dense, locally grown food, you still have to watch how you eat. So... I'm working on that. I'm also trying to bring you information on training low, racing high, talking to Dr. Dan Plews. We talked to Paul Larson, Zach Bitter, and today's episode, we're talking to Leighton Phillips, the founder of S Fuels. I haven't raced Ironman, I admit. I started in 2001, raced until 2013, and then adrenal exhaustion after that. I haven't raced, and it's too much on my body to race again at that distance and the level I don't want to just do a race to do it I want to go and be in top of my age group so I'm not gonna just spend eight hundred dollars just for no reason (laughs) I've been there done it so no offense if you're just doing it to finish it I want to do it and place on the podium so here's the deal there isn't one size fits all approach there is a template we can use as a starting point so we've talked to Rob Wolf this season earlier in the year talk about his carb tolerance test. We've talked to Peter Defty a few times on carb, strategic carb timing and what he calls OFM, optimal fat metabolism. And we've talked to more the non-athletic side on fasting and female athletes and menopausal women with Dr. Mindy Pels, talked to Ben Azadi, Dr. Anna Kabeca, and... Cynthia Thurlow. Now, I'm trying to take all this information we hear out there for general nutritional ketosis and fasting for people that are metabolically damaged. And then there's us, the endurance athlete, the triathlete who might be probably working out more than once a day and tends to be the high performing overachiever doing too much of everything because we're already busy and then we try to fit all these workouts in. I don't have children. But most of you have kids and you're trying to fit it all in and you're creating more stress in your body. And chronic stress, as you might know from my personal story, does not serve you well. (laughs) So I'm trying to help you avoid what happened to me so you can still thrive every day and not struggle with fatigue, unexplained weight gain, with anxiety, depression, gut dysbiosis, bloating, gas, constipation, whatever. I didn't have that stuff, but I have pathogens, uh, dysbiosis you know, digestion issues, slow motility. There's a lot. And then we go into hormones, which impact all of this. Thyroid, root cortisol, your melatonin, your DHA, all your hormones, testosterone, estrogens. We need to look at all of that. So that's what I do as a health and fitness coach, kind of combining everything I've done over the years. But being a health investigator where I take the functional lab tests as I'm an FDM practitioner, so I can do that. And then looking at nutritional therapy, and adding that in. But there's a lot to look at, and I, I'm i trying to share that on the podcast so you get free information. Then if you want more, you can talk to a coach as myself and really get more of a personalized attention, personalized program. So I had a few questions that I asked some of my peers. I wanted to know how other people in our field who are working with endurance athletes as myself coaching them how to find strategic carb timing. What is the right amount? So Ben Greenfield suggests, you know, saving all your carbs for nighttime, have them at dinner, strategic carb timing in that evening meal. So then you can wake up and do a workout and you have enough 
glycogen stores topped off. Then there's people to do, you know, nutritional ketosis, say whatever grams a day, and then have a little more carb refeed one day a week. That's if you're not working out as much. So we have to really be careful, especially the female athlete and matching our hormone cycle with our training and nutrition cycle that we're mapping it all out because the guidelines are going to be different for you depending on when you are exercising, what intensity, what duration, what was your sleep like, what did you eat the night before. There's so much to look at. So I've been using BioSense to find out I need a new CGM from NutriSense to do that again because it was, it's all expensive, I must say, doing, you know, the, the BioSense is like under $300, but NutriSense, you have to get, say you do 90 days and you get 14 days CGM. And then, so you'll get six of those in a 30 day program or sorry, 90 days, but it's so worth it to learn about how food impacts you. Or you can do keto mojo, prick your finger, test your ketones, test your glucose that way. So we have a carb tolerance test. Rob Wolf in his book called Wired to Eat has it written out and you can look up on the internet. So the carb tolerance test is what I was asking if people do that to figure out what is the ideal carb tolerance for you so your glucose doesn't spike, say, over 30 on your glucose meter. Now, if you do the carb tolerance test by Rob, you eat, pick a food off his list that has 50 grams of effective carbohydrates, and that's all you eat. And then you go and check your glucose response two hours after the meal, just your carbohydrate test food. That's all you're eating. Wait two hours and test with your glucose meter. Now, he says this in his book, Wired Deep, page 200. This literally means that you eat your test food meal, set the timer for two hours, and take blood sugar tests as per the instructor's instructions associated with the glucometer. Ideally, your blood glucose will be between 90 and 115 at that point. Now, if it's higher than this range, he'd like you to retest that food on a different day at breakfast again, eating 25 grams of effective carbs. So you just cut that 50 gram portion in half, retest your glucose response two hours after this meal. If it is still above 115, then this food is likely not a good fit for you. So you want to test. Now, we all agree carbs that we talk about to strategic carb timing, carb tolerance tests are real food sources. No one's telling you, except some people might, but most of us I hear are not saying eat refined sugars, refined flours and vegetable oils. No one's saying that. We're saying nutrient dense, whole foods, nature's foods. So nutrient dense above ground, below ground carbohydrates. So on the list, you want to test on page 202 and wired to eat you'll test what is serving size is listed here what is 50 grams of carbs what does that look like a corn tortilla you know that's five and a half tortilla small ones and looking at what is 50 grams of effective carbs so corn tortillas or quinoa or gluten-free bread lentils black beans and then there's vegetables white potato sweet potato parsnips cassava taro yam butternut squash carrots lotus fruits are also listed and so it goes on and on to like four different pages so you can do that to figure out how you react to carbohydrates i'm more carb intolerant as i said i'm more high maintenance and i can't take as much but i have a client clayton that can eat anything he wants of real good food he can eat a lot of carbs and he's so lean and strong and super fit iron man athlete but my genetics i'm more prone to type 2 diabetes and I have to make sure I'm right amount of macronutrient balance. That's why I feel better intuitively with a heavier protein load and healthy fats. And I just recently switched that. Instead of focusing on eating as much fats as I can, I wasn't feeling as full as I do with protein. And that I'm like, oh, I'm stuffed. I can't eat anymore. But if I have carbs, I can eat for hours. So that's why I found years ago, gosh, like 2001, 2005, I stopped you know, doing so many carbs because I realized I was always hungry eating the carbohydrate plan, even though it was a banana and orange juice. So that's something to look at the carb tolerance test, raw wolf. Also, NutriSense, Keto Mojo, using a CGM for NutriSense or levels can help you a lot figure out, okay, what did that food do? Did it glucose spike more than 30? 
or in nutritional therapy, a free method is the Coco Pulse Test. You can look that up. Super old, Arthur Coco. And it's just taking your pulse before, put that food in your mouth, on your tongue even, and the receptors will, your body will taste that food. And if it's a reactive food, your pulse will go up. So that's the easy way. If your heart rate goes up six beats, that can tell you a lot. There's also heart rate variability tests that you can do as well to find out if that food is reactive to you. Now, I get a headache right away from foods, so I can tell, but a lot of times you have to single out what food is giving you that reaction. So just think that reaction is a source of stress. And if you're doing that to yourself every day, you're having another source of chronic stress, adding to that beaker of stress. Now, the other question I've been asking my peers are what Dr. Mindy's talking about, and I'm trying to tailor this to the female athlete and taking what Dr. Stacy Sims is sharing and then what Dr. Mindy Pels is saying and mapping out the cycle. So progesterone hormone building days 20 to 28, or whenever the end of your cycle is, we don't want to be in nutritional ketosis for a female. So female athlete, how many carbs are too many or too little? So really figuring that out, I don't really get an answer for everyone because it's so individualized, but not going probably, and Dan Plews talks about this, like 100, 130 grams of carbs might be enough for you. Because I know some females that are carb intolerant, they are trying to add more carbs in their progesterone building phase, end of their cycle, and during ovulation, estrogen building foods, and progesterone building foods at the appropriate days, times of the month, and then they're afraid they're going to raise their glucose and gain weight. So you got to track your food, what how food responds to you, and make sure you don't think that's a whole pass to eat whatever you want. It's like, oh. Day 20, I can go on a binge fast and eat all carbs and overindulge. Nope, that's not the answer. It's still nutrient-dense nature's foods, nurturing your body with real food sources. So you can look at my website, debbiepotsnot.net, for what are progesterone-building foods that Dr. Mindy suggests, and then look at the estrogen-building days during ovulation, what foods those would be. So looking at how many carbs to have, talk to Peter Defty on I think we did like three podcasts this year, but go back and listen to those strategic carb dinner at dinner, or if you're doing a long workout, I'll record another podcast this month for my new monthly solo podcast, solo cast, that I'll talk about what Ben Greenfield talk about, talked about in our coaching program and how to place those carbs, depending on if you're doing two day or if you're, so if you're working out within another eight hours, that's where you place your carbs after your first workout. And then if you're doing a higher intensity workout and going into more, some ideas for how you can integrate your nutrition and match your feeling with your nutrition. So the female athlete is different than the male athlete. So we're working on that. And then we go to what Dr. Gabrielle Leon's telling us, if you're not an athlete, your body can use store burn only about 40 grams of carbs after a meal. Now that's different for athletes. She said, I emailed her about this and she said, this is not for the athlete. The 40 grams per meal max is different for an athlete. You have to earn your carbohydrates. And when you eat after a higher intensity speed workout or HIIT training, cardio burst, you're going to need a little bit more carbs or, you know, some people could say you can stay carnivore and get those carbs from glycogenesis, gluconeogenesis means making glucose. So meals that exceed 40 grams require more insulin to shut down fat metabolism and they force extra carbs to be converted into fat storage, limiting the body to burn fat, increase blood glucose fluctuations and increase hunger. Now that's if you do not exercise. So those people that are going so low carb and only can do 40 grams carbs a meal and more prone to insulin resistance, they are not exercising like most of you are. So take the information you hear out there, but remember it's N equals one and no one's the same, same workout schedule. So today we're going to talk to Layton. I met Layton S. Fuels. Is, he founded... Let's see, I talked to him in 2018 when Dan Plews won the top age group athlete record time for Ironman Hawaii and found their product to be pretty amazing. And I've always been impressed with their research and really, you know, who knows about glutamine for gut health? They actually have glutamine in their train and MCT oils and their training 
fuel and Dr. Dan Plews and Zach Bitter are both a part of S Fuels on their advisory board and they are walking the talk and doing the research and I'm doing Dan Plews and your IQ coaching program right now learning more updated kind of stuff I've done since uh, got into this in 2005 but really learning all about how we can train low and race high the 80 20 rule periodization and really working on how you can be more fat adapted but still use those carbs as your backup fuel course fuel source so you can have that extra kick to race to the finish line so Dan Plews will talk to you soon after summer vacations and listen to what Zach Bitter says about his ultra marathon training and how to put this all together. So ideally, you know, working with a coach to figure out what's best for you, we're all just giving you information. So let's bring on Leighton Phillips, the founder of S Fuels, to learn more about how you can go longer in your training and racing as an endurance athlete. Look in the show notes. We do have a discount code for our podcast listeners. As always, you can do your part in supporting this podcast and the expenses that go with it and order with our coupon code. And you can save money and support the show at the same time. All right. I finally have S Fuels founder Leighton Phillips on the show. I think it's been about four years. I've been trying to schedule this. <laughs> so <laughs> thanks for coming on the low carb athlete podcast to talk about fueling and training for the endurance athlete. No, you're welcome. Yeah. I think it was what Kona in 2018 where we first connected. So uh, yeah. we've been busy people. <laughs> yeah. You guys have done so much since I first met you guys in the train drink mix. And now you've got a full line of stuff and programs and amazing athletes involved in your program. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. We were, one, we were a one product pony back then. So uh, things have changed. Yeah. I can't imagine doing all that. So let's dive in to talk about, I was like, ask people what's their why your purpose passion you know what drives you and there's always a story behind a product (laughs) so especially the endurance athlete because there's very few of us especially back then doing low carb fueling low carb for the endurance sports being a fat adapted athlete and you know we've been talking about this on the show for 10 years i started doing all this testing metabolic efficiency back in 2005 so it's been a long time and now finally people starting to figure it out maybe a little bit more that when you're doing Ironmans and marathons and trail running, it's not a carb fueled sport. (laughs) So talk about your story, your journey. Yeah, no, you're spot on. Um, There's just a ton of opportunity for innovation in this space. Uh, Frankly, I think we're all just scratching at the surface. Um, But our, our story began, I guess, like a lot of the products in the industry, right? Where an athlete, you know, generally has a problem with uh what's available and it's not working for them for whatever reason um and um you know begin to play around with alternatives and we we began to toy around on the back of gut problems that i was in hong kong at the time you know huge ultra running scene down there um and uh yeah i mean 30 kilometers in you're starting to get gut problems and i was on a classic high carb off the shelf product and um so yeah, we started toying around with things literally out of the kitchen. <laughs> and mm-hmm. um then we started working with some labs in California on really developing. We felt like there's plenty of opportunity here to innovate and the products that are available on the market. We didn't really like the approach um they were taking. We thought that there was um uh, a better way to do this and that was just an idea. And then we started working with the labs and um, we did up some prototypes that worked well in a number of uh, ultra races. And then, you know, we started, we felt like, um, you know, initially it was really just um, the gut issue. And as a function of that, you kind of were limited to how much load you could put into your training. So Mm -hmm. as we began to create some of these products and it was literally one initially a training product, uh, we could like really lay on a lot more volume. And initially the performance side, it wasn't driven off the back of performance. But what we found is, is as we had, were able to add a lot more volume into our training, uh, performance certainly improved. And 
you know, since then we've taken it into the labs and we can talk Debbie about the performances we've had obviously in the race and the race field, but Mm -hmm. we have now a lot of lab data with, um, all the work we've done with Dan, uh, Dan blues. And, um, yeah, I mean, so that was our first product and the SF and S feels a lot of people don't know this. They think it's like San Francisco or something like that, but, (laughs) Um, I never we, even thought about, well, yeah, what is S fuels? S. Yeah. Cause everyone says, ah, oh, SF fuels or S, how do you say this thing? Well, it's, it's S fuels, but the SF, um, was from the, from the get go. We wanted to, on one hand, uh, look at, you know, just if you will, performance in the moment of whatever it is, the sport you're doing. And then for the long range, uh, the longevity of the lifestyle we love in this kind of endurance sport. Uh, so we did, um, fasting blood glucose testing from the start on every product we develop. Uh, so the SF was with respect to spike free. And for, in fact, the oh. first company we registered was, uh, was registered as spike free. Uh, and then we got some better marketing advice, but, um, that's what the SF stood for. And, uh, still to this day, every development we work on, we look at, um, blood fasting, glucose responses, uh, classic testing. In fact, we just published a paper on our breakfast product up against rolled oats and a whole bunch of things. And yeah, it's really interesting data. So you're testing the blood sugar so it doesn't spike more than 30 or what are you looking for when you're testing products? Spike uh, What's Typically we're more in the single digit space. Uh, we, we, you know, even our breakfast product, it might come up 10 points. Um, and even that, you know, th- there's a lot of stuntsmanship out on social media with doing this fasting blood glucose testing, but we we really look at um, not really just the spike, but what you're really looking for is if there's an actually inverted uh, decline, which is a classic uh, signal of insulinogenic response, um, and we're also just understanding postprandial after the after the intake mm-hmm. of that food, what happens with the next meal. Uh, there are two factors that are really important, particularly when you're trying to optimize fat oxidation, you really want to obviously limit um, insulogenic response. So that's what we're looking at um, when we do this testing. So when you started this product, it was more a personal interest because you're trying to figure out, you're curious of how not to have GI stress as a endurance athlete, you do triathlons and ultra running yourself, right? And so common like GI stress is what a lot of people come from having too many sugars and bars and glucose, whatever products in their belly, throwing up while they're racing, (laughs) having diarrhea and all the great things as endurance athletes. But you started to think outside of the box back when you were racing. Yeah, that was the driver. I mean, my background um, has a technology band. And then I studied six years in naturopathic medicine. I practiced for a few years. So and my wife's uh, ex Nestle, she runs the business. Um, so together, we kind of had the science and like the business side of, of the food business, if you will. Um, so I felt like with my naturopathic studies, which has a lot of uh, focus on gut health that um, there was just something wrong here. And initially I thought it was just me. And when I started looking at sports science uh, research, particularly in Ironman, UTMB and some of the large uh, hundred miles around the world, I find that there's a ton of uh, research on, you know, gut, uh, gut distress association with both high carb um, use and also some of the uh, caffeine formulas. So mm. That's where it began. But since then, of course, we've done a lot of work on how we formulated the product to um, optimize performance. So, yeah. So let's start with how to be fat adapted. I know Dr. Dan Plews, I've been doing his Endure program stuff that we've talked about, you know, metabolic efficiency testing, as, as I said, starting that back in 2005 and becoming fat adapted athlete. What have you found is is good? Because before you want to take your products, which we'll get to how to fuel the low carb athlete, but how do we become of a low carb athlete to that burns fat as their main fuel source? I mean, we've talked about this a thousand times, but what is your perspective on that fat adaptation process from? Yeah, I think there's, yeah, three elements here. One is obviously training protocol. Secondly, um, you know, you can make gains by just raw volume of training and particularly zone two aerobic training. Um, but ideally, there to really kind of thrust you into uh, a far more efficient uh, fat oxidation metabolic state, 
we do think there needs to be a, you know, if you will, cold keto transition phase to really help catapult you into that. And then once you're there, there is, there is more flexibility and give once you're there relative to volume and training load. Um, so, you know, we can talk about each of them, but I think firstly, from a training perspective, you know, honestly, best bang for buck is still in terms of hours per week. If you're going to be doing, you know, only 11 hours a week, well, your first 10 should be in zone two, uh, you know, aerobic work. And that's purely a function of really improving mitochondrial density, um, and even enzymatic, um, improvements in how fat is oxidized. We, you know, we've had athletes that in the labs have tripled those numbers. Uh, and, uh, a lot of that's to do with just getting that ratio right between zone two. And there's not a lot of value in doing high intensity if you're only doing a few hours of zone two every week. Mm -hmm. So, so that's the first thing. And then typically we talk about a two week, um, cold keto phase to really help thrust, you know, an athlete into that state. Um, and even, even like coming into each season, you're coming off the off season into the on season, if you will. A lot of athletes now who are, who have a lifestyle like this will run that or rerun that, you know, two weeks of kind of a lower carb um, state. But once you're through that, Debbie, like, um, again, when, you know, athletes in kind of half Ironman, full Ironman, 50K to 100 mile running, I mean, generally, they're probably sitting in the 100 to 150 state, which is not, it's not keto low. Uh, it's low relative to the Western diet. But, you know, we we certainly on our lab data would suggest that they can still have, you know, one one point something grams per minute of fat oxidation uh, when they're out on the metabolic cart. And that's a good signal that, you know, they're processing fat pretty well. So is that looking at the RQ value when you're doing the metabolic testing? To yeah, see we where typically... They're at? typically run a 20 minute, um, um, inten- you know, basically intensity ramp. And then uh, it's essentially a VO2 max and then calculated, you know, they're calculating, um, uh, through the, um, uh, through their carbon dioxide and oxygen, um, you know, consumption. And, uh, we, we basically are looking for, as we get into that threshold space, like what is their fat max? And we, we feel like from a, um, you know, Dan's shop and our shop somewhere between one and 1.2 is a fairly, um, you know, healthy range for the sport that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And I I would just emphasize, like we can get on and talk about our racing products. Yeah. Um, you know, but the segmentation at S fuels, it's not all about fat oxidation. The body not by fluke has a very strong ability to oxidize carbohydrate has a very strong ability to oxidize fat. And it's not about one or the other, Yeah. but really thinking about the structure of the event that we're going after and optimizing accordingly. So, you know, all I'm talking about so far is the baseline of, yes. you know, training fat oxidation. And that's why I felt like this was an important conversation to have because I've been talking so much about this and I think it's so confusing out there in social media hearing all this keto information, but it's not for the endurance athlete or the female athlete. We need to adjust those recommendations. And the main goal is to be burning fat as our main fuel source, but still be able to shift to that carb rocket fuel backup source when required. And we'll get into fueling because I think that's an important part of why I love what you guys offer your education and the product that you need to have some carbs. And I think we, so many people that get into keto for keto endurance and keto athletes that think I need to be in nutritional ketosis when I'm doing these long training events as a three, four hour long bike ride or trail run and that they need to show ketosis. And they're all about like, what can I do to stay in ketosis when they join our um, Facebook group page? And and I'm always like, isn't it the main goal to burn fat as your fuel and have that ability shift to carbs when I'm going to race? Because sometimes you might have a steep hill climb or you're going to have a surge or you're in a right. race and you're actually going to pick up the pace. So I think there's so much more confusion out there for people that are athletes switching to trying to be keto, but when is it appropriate to show nutritional ketosis? And that's what I like Dan's into your IQ program for people to do and then using your fueling and training program. So yeah, we have- split it up. Like, I yeah. mean, um, you know, I guess on one hand, you could look at S fields. Uh, we, we have a true segmentation between endurance athletes and like active lifestyles that are non-competitive mm-hmm. in a sense. 
And on that side of the house, actually, um, you know, there's, there's not a lot of need for, um, you could absolutely go keto. You don't need a whole lot of carbohydrate in that state. Um, but for the endurance athlete, if performance is what you're after, why wouldn't you oxidize both? Right. Um, the problem is, of course, is that most metabolism left to their own devices will gravitate to, you know, more carbohydrate centric diet and lifestyle, particularly in the world we're living in. So, um, so yeah, I mean, we, we, we're not against keto. In fact, we, we, we really have built a segment strategy that talks to that active lifestyle that needs convenience. And there is a lot of health benefits in a keto profile, Mm -hmm. but don't expect when you roll up for 70.3 that when the gun goes off, you may have all the, the horsepower that, you know, someone who's doing fat and carb beside you has. Yeah. And that's why I like what Dan has to say in the Endure program is, you know, looking at training low, racing high, and we'll get to that gradually working towards the how to fuel because that's the confusing part for people. But training, we talked about just summarize. We're saying like, you know, we talk 80% of the time we're doing the mapitone type of low intensity zone two. And if you can ideally get metabolic testing cart from somewhere near you, so you can figure out what exactly those numbers are and they will change each season too. They're not going to be like, I, last time I got tested, I was able to go up to 160 something and burn tons of fat, but not anymore at this age <laughs> at my yeah. level. I'm not training for Ironman, but at my highest point of his athlete, I was able to go very high percentage of fat at a high heart rate because of the way I trained and fueled. But looking at that is so important to add in appropriate time when to add in that hit science. Like uh, we just talked to Paul Larson and talk about that 20% when it's appropriate after you built your foundation of zone two, when to add in, yeah. The hit training and side note, I just was recording a little video this morning from my Instagram that, okay. Cause I think a lot of people think they do hit training, but they really don't push themselves hard that they're just still right. kind of like, Oh, I'm doing intervals, but they're not going all out to make You're it just really sitting effective. Over zone three. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, that's fairly common. Um, there's a really good, by the way, I was just, I think I've watched it four times and it's a two hour long detailed science podcast by Peter Atia and uh, Inigo Samalan. And Inigo, mm-hmm. Inigo is the, uh, he's out at the University of Colorado, um, but he's the uh, performance physiologist for Teddy Picaccio, the uh, the cyclist, the Tour de France cyclist. And that two hours is all on the detailed science of what you just talked about. Zone two, how much time to spend on it, what happens in the physiology so if you really want to get deep in the science, that's a, a great uh, detailed up. review of it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's an important part. Cause as I keep sharing my journey, as I turn 50, I'm not going to train the same way that I did when I was 30. And yeah. I can tell intuitively, I just lack that get up and go power and speed. So I need to do, plus I've been doing stuff for 25 years, low heart rate, long distance stuff. So my body's pretty good at going long and slow. I need to get faster. So as a female aging athlete, I'm going to add in a little bit more training and looking at what Dr. Stacey Sims is showing her science that, you know, she calls it SIT short intensity intervals, like 30 seconds, maybe a minute, but go hard as you can. I I, again, say so many people, we don't know how to go hard because we're so, I think when we do low heart rates too long and we forget to add that hit training in, we lose that ability to like know how to push yourselves. Cause we're like, Oh, you know, in that comfort, I can stay here forever that we don't know what that go all out feels like. <laughs> it's funny you say that because, um, I hadn't had metabolic testing done until a few years back and it really came into, um, Dan suggesting going, doing it. And then I went and got the data and I sent the data to Dan <laughs> and similar to yourself, like, you know, I can burn fat and go all day. Um, but then he was saying, you're lacking the, the, the top end. So, and I, you know, we get a little bit of input back on, oh, do you lose your top end with this? Um, Mm -hmm. one of our athletes who actually just won, uh, in, in Utah, uh, in July, he became the world champion age group Ironman athlete. He set the record there in Utah, uh, Matt Kerr, um, when Matt started working with, uh, S fuels, and Dan back in, I think it's 2019 or 18, he had a fat oxidation level of 0.53. 
uh, milligrams per minute, but that was at 135 watts. That was so his maximum fat oxidation was happening at 135 watts. Today, he's uh, got 1.8 um, uh, grams of fat per minute, and he does that at 300 watts. So uh, we know it's highly trainable. Um, and it's not about losing that top end, but it is absolutely about, you still exactly what you said. You've got to have that foundation and then you've got to add your, you know, your high intensity interval work above that. Yeah. Cause I have a lot of new clients recently that are trying to get this, that adaptation process through matching their nutrition and training in their labs and the holistic approach I do, but they have been doing that black hole training, you know, that what we always talk about the you know, the low and slow, and then there's high, but that in between black hole, we want to avoid so many people when they start like a math type of low intensity training, like I can't run below 150 heart rate, just doesn't go down or just keeps crawling up. So I think it's important to have that foundation and then layer in. The other one, the other one too, that's interesting. And the more data we get, the more we see a difference between you assume that, you know, when you stand on a treadmill and run this test, and then you move to a bike that those numbers will be the same. We've seen dramatically different numbers between bike and run in terms mm-hmm. of how the body handles uh, carbs and fat. Um, and, and that's really important in the spirit of if you knew that, what you would do in a, the, the nature of a triathlon race would be quite different to what you would take on the bike and what you would take in the run. So um, it's really important. So let's get into fueling. I, going back to you said what Dr. Mark. Dan, Dan Plews talks about is, you know, that in the Enduro program, a hundred carbs, 130 carbs. And I think it varies, especially for females. I'm trying to map it out for that's going to be different around ovulation, their luteal phase, it might be a little higher, but, and then also tapering for a race adding in because we get confused of what we hear out there from mainstream keto is 50 grams of carbs total a day. And athletes are scared to do a hundred or, you know, 300 grams and they still show fat burning or so low levels of ketosis. Maybe it's like 0.5 on their keto blood meter, but what fueling and how do we use like nutrition, real food, and, and then looking at your training products when we're eating food or eating meals during the day. And then when we're training, how do we fit in? our macros, like how do we adjust things to be yeah. still burning fat? And we're working on say a three, four hour bike ride. And I want to eat my dinner <clears throat> Friday night for a long ride is what I keep talking about what to eat that morning of people get confused, like where to time their carbs. So they're not going to have a yeah. glucose spike. So, um, you know, the first thing, uh, we, we spent a lot of time talking to people about what happens between, um, if you will, if you will, on the couch and then just actively meaning like walking or what have you. And then as you go into aerobic and then into anaerobic, understanding, uh, how those different systems switch on and off in those periods can guide us a lot <clears throat> to think about then how we would feel. Um, you know, at rest, uh, those, the, the channels in the muscle cell that can take glucose are really only opened up through insulin. And that is a function of obviously, you know, sensation of rise in blood sugar levels and a pancreatic response to that. Uh, it takes about 30 to 60 minutes of muscle contraction. And there's still a debate out there whether it is the contraction itself or whether it's calcium ions and nitric oxide some of the free radicals that come about as a function of muscle uh, contraction that triggers, um, if you will, some of the internals of uh, the cell to actually shift things to the cell edge to open up those channels without insulin. But it takes about 30 to 60 minutes. And why there's a range there is all to do with intensity. Um, But at that point, um, it's not that you need insulin to get glucose out of the blood supply and into the cell. And it's at that point that you have the ability, because there's very little insulin, to then simultaneously be oxidizing fat and carbohydrate. So what does all that mean? Well, what that means is that if you are in a state where you're not active and you are to take carbohydrate at that point in any form, and obviously, you know, the the glucose uh, index and also load can have a lot of effect on the nature of the uh, insulin response, but... At that point, if you were to take carbohydrate, you will see a rise in insulin, and that clearly will blunt um, a ketogenic state. 
uh, it will uh, blunt uh, the oxidation of, of fatty acids and lipolysis. Um, as you begin to increase your intensity of training or high intensity training, what have you, or racing, uh, and those uh, those glute four channels open in the muscle cells, uh, at that point you have a lot more flexibility. Um, I would only add that the quality of carbohydrate at that point can have a lot of bearing um, on how the body handles it, both in the gut and the liver, and obviously the transport yeah. towards. Uh, towards the uh, muscle cells. So, so just hold on. You said a key word that I keep saying, quality carbohydrate. I think that's the biggest confusion. Sorry, you broke up there. Oh. Quality carbohydrate, right? Sorry, you broke up there for a second. You might want to just restate that, Debbie. Sorry. Oh. So quality carbohydrate is what a lot of people, I think, get misled of. I'm going to add more carbs in. We're all saying real food, nutrient dense, quality, <laughs> nature's food, carbohydrates. And I think that's where I always have, feel like lately I need to be more specific. Yeah. This is what we're all talking about. We're not saying go get yeah. this packaged food. We're saying right. go get your safe starches, whatever you want to call it, your underground vegetables, fruits, your berries, stuff like that. But so I just wanted to throw that in quality. Yeah, I mean, generally... <laughs> It was the same as you. I mean, your classic berries, right? Um, non-starchy veg. And even if you go into some of the starchy veg, you know, we, we've written a few articles on this is, you know, there is the, a way to offset that in terms of how glycemically res responsive those foods are by basically heating them up and then cooling them and getting the mm -hmm. resistant starch level to rise uh, in those whole foods, right? So. Yeah. You see in the Asian foods, a lot of, you know, cooled rice consumption. You'll see a uh, cool potato consumption, nice. the Western diet less so, but there's a reason for that. And that is that, that resistant starch rises, the blood sugar response is much less uh, on those mm -hmm. types of starches. Yeah. So sorry to interrupt there, but I just think it's so important to yeah. clarify <laughs> what yeah. carb the word yeah. carbohydrates gets tied into sure. everything. So, go on. so, so then I, if you kind of put that out against the day, like then, you know, I mean, typically we're, we're kind of more advocating a, if, if there's a, if it's a morning training session is to do that somewhat fasted, meaning if you will start the day without food, obviously hydration is fine. Mm -hmm. Have the session. Uh, and we can talk about the nature of that session. You might tweak things a little bit, depending on the nature of that session, come out of that. And then you've got a window where still, those GLUT4 channels are open to take in glucose. You are not got glucose hanging around in the bloodstream for so long. So it gives you a little bit of a window there that if you're going to have some of the starches we just talked about, that's what, that would be a good window to take it. And frankly, after any of your training blocks, um, that is a good window to take it. So just made me tie in that what you're just saying is working out fasted in the mornings. That was a big discussion this year. It's like, do I eat or do I not eat? And if I'm going to go work out, it's like we were in Austin working out in the gym six in the morning. Yeah, I, I'm not going to eat something. I'll have coffee, a few sips right, and a little right. bit of cream. Right. Or I've been using Laird's creamer with some mushroom adaptogens in it because I'm into that. Uh, but when is it, you know, I think it gets confusing. And I know Ben Greenfield says 12 to 15 hours. But if I ate dinner the night before, 12 hours before, I, I can do a fasted workout but i think it's this is where we get abusive as especially stressed people and female athletes of doing too long of a fast and going into the exercise yeah. and depending on the intensity so anything add in there yeah, would be great. Our, our thoughts there are if you look at the half-life of insulin um it's actually fairly rapidly passed through the liver and degraded um and i think uh look Again, it's funny if if I was talking to an Asian audience, I'd really have a topic on this because it's common for parts of Asia to be consuming their dinner meal at nine, ten, eleven p.m. at night. In the yeah. Western world, that's more so in the six, seven p.m. at night. So I think that, that you know, from our perspective, it feels like you know, eight to ten hours. You, I think is a, is a good period of time to just let. You know, things pass through the stomach. We think insulin absolutely is cleared by then. Um, and coming into that first training session, sure, um, caffeine-based products, in fact, uh, probably are helpful in the spirit of uh, what they can do with accelerating fat oxidation. But outside of that, I would, you know, 
not do anything and just let the body, you know, force the body, if you will, into a sense, starting to utilize fat out of the blocks for the day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause I've had these conversations cause I've been doing fasted exercise for years and in the morning, cause it's just, you know, you can't, I'm not going to get up and eat. I'm not hungry. And two, I don't want to eat or exercise with food in my belly. <laughs> so I think it's, it's more easier. a cognitive function we need in the morning. Yeah. And I think it's more so cognitive support is, uh, and you know whether it's coming into training or coming into a, the day in the office i think cognitive support is what we first probably need mm-hmm. um it's it's really from uh if particularly once fat fat ox um adapted uh it's not like you really need this uh straight out of the blocks in the morning yeah plus cortisol is up in the morning too at its highest point so you're gonna have some natural energy that's right. why glucose will be a little naturally higher yeah. so i think that's yeah. important to look at but I think is, you know, I'm always saying too, are you, is what you're doing working for you? If you're trying to lose weight and you're exercising, you're doing fasted exercise, or you're, you know, going too low carb, maybe, you know, maybe there's something you need to course correct, adjust for you, the individual, when you're working on this fat oxidation program, if you're not losing weight. And cause I think a yeah. lot of people do all this stuff I'm like, okay, I still have 20 pounds to lose what's missing. Well, the other, the other piece that I, again, I just wrote another paper, in fact, last week on this, and that is, uh, you know, protein shakes is a very, it's a very strong U S cultured thing. Um, like I feel like I've lived in five countries now around the world. I feel like it's very strong here that wake up and grab and go heavy protein shake. Uh, and I'm not really pushing so much on the risk of gluconeogenesis where you take in protein and it converts it to glucose. Um, I, I'm not a big believer on that being a major problem here, but I, I absolutely for whey proteins, you know, you start getting up into the 30 gram per dose space and that whey, whey protein isolate particularly um, can be quite insulinogenic. So, you know, your blood sugars, it may be, um, pick your product on the market, but it might have some type of sugar alcohols, which we can talk about. We don't use it, but it's sugar alcohols and protein and a flavor. Uh, so it's sweet. There's very little carbohydrate, but it has this high isolate. So it's not like your blood sugars are going to go up, but what you will see go up is an insulin response from that isolate. And um, I think uh, some people are kind of thinking they're doing everything and they're having the shake every morning only to work out. They just can't get rid of this last part of this weight around the middle. And yes. uh, I think it's a lot to do with the insulinogenic response of shakes every morning. Hmm. Okay. So if we wake up and we exercise, cause a lot of us are trap leads doing two days. Yeah. So example, I usually run a couple of days during the week, maybe some intervals, high, low, or maybe low, easy, depending on the workout. But then I swim masters usually at noonish time. So, and that often can be hard or it can be easy to depending on what I feel like doing, <laughs> staying yeah. in the back or pushing myself. So how would you fuel with real food and looking at what S fuels get, provides the endurance athlete? Because I think that gets tricky what to eat and when and where, yeah, I want to be burning fat when I'm working out. But sometimes I, I need that car backup fuel because I'm going to do hard speed workout. I'm going to be doing sprints in the pool in masters. So what have you guys found as the low carb athlete fueling them for improved performance? In their training? Yeah. When we, when we started um, the first product, actually the first product we built was a, a bar product. Um, but the first hydration product we, we built was our train product. And if you look at that, there's only 60 calories per serve. So by design, you look at that and you say, well, what's this doing? By design, it's not trying to mimic the uh, calories out, calories in construct. It is literally trying to use certain fats that stimulate the body from an enzyme's perspective to use fat. So that's 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 where we started. And um, it was working well. However, we quickly got into exactly what you said, which was for athletes doing back-to-back sessions in a given day, uh, the bounce back, if you will, for the second session, uh, we felt like particularly if the first session uh, was a some type of long, slow distance session, aerobic zone two session, and then the second session was a more, you know, intense, uh, sorry, interval based type session where the intensity was higher. Um, what we have come to, what we built in our race plus products for high intensity training and racing 
is that there there should be on that first session uh, after an hour into it some carbohydrate that really is replenishing to set you up for your second session in the afternoon. It's not like for that first session you really need it, but you will absolutely notice a difference by adding some there and having it you know support your second session. And what I said earlier is really important here. Um, this is not about on that first session of the morning out of the block starting on a carbohydrate product. You need that 30 to 60 minutes initially. Let the GLUT4 channels open up. Then you can add your fat and your carbohydrate together. And you will not be having, you can see this on a blood glucose. Most people that do their blood glucose testing do it on the couch in the morning and waking up, right? If you really want to see some interesting stuff is, do it through your training blocks. And you'll see that if you start taking some carbohydrate an hour in, very little change, right, in ketogenic response, little change in uh, blood glucose response, insulin response. You don't actually produce a lot of insulin during during training. So this is important because now you can simultaneously take both substrates in. It's uh, not really affecting the the here and now of fat oxidation, but it's going to help that second session in the afternoon. So that's like two hours after your morning workout. So maybe you're done at 7 a.m. So maybe you wait two hours. So 9 a.m. You start to have some fat carbs or how long? Um, I was I'm more a, kind of in the hour. actual training session. Oh, and. So let's say it's an hour and a half long training session. First half hour, you're, whether you use our train product, which has zero carb, it's it's sub one gram of carbs mm-hmm. um, or, or whatever you use. And then the next hour, if again, you're having a second big interval session in the afternoon, yeah. the second That's hour of that first it. training, you can add some carbohydrate. So it's funny is just from doing this for so many years that you kind of get to a point. I think a lot of people experience is that they feel guilty having any carbohydrates. <laughs> so yeah, then you have to like, Oh my gosh, I'm cheating if I have carbohydrates. And that's what I always ask people when they say, you know, what do you eat for fuel? And all just the questions you get in this Facebook group page, we have keto endurance that it's like, do you want to improve performance? Do you want to get faster or are you just trying to finish? And as, so I think it goes to what are your goals? You know, is it exactly are you trying to burn right. fat or, you know, you look at the stress and the sleep component, are you totally stressed out and then you're not eating anything and I'm going to go do another workout because exactly. I can not eat for four hour back rate. I can work right. out in the morning and not eat until two o'clock in the afternoon. But is that good for me? Is right. that causing more stress and damage to my body or is it going to help my performance or fat loss. So I'm always asking those questions to myself and others. Yeah, I think, um, you know, for some folks, um, rightly or wrongly, the, the competition is the biggest number on their ketone or glucometer, right? <laughs> um, and if that's your goal, you know, probably, yeah, your routine is going to be different. But, you know, if, if we're after performance, the body is not um, – it's just uh, by luckily has these two ways of substrate different sub uh, oxidize different substrates. It's there for a reason. Yeah. Um, and using both for the right reasons is uh, mm-hmm. we think what's best for performance. And I think Rob Wolf has really been speaking out about that too, because he comes from the jujitsu and CrossFit background that more of a higher heart rate workout. And it's probably it's Dr. Stacy Sims argument against carb f- battle. We all have is that, you know, they're doing higher intensity workouts, but what if you are fat adapted doing the low heart rate, but you know, it's not, you need to have both. And when you need that, you know, I think it's important because I know some people that just are on the zero carb mentality and that we have yeah. demonized carbs <laughs> yeah. totally, but again, quality source carbs. And we got a real range now, like, you know, like, again, when we started, we, we started with working with Dan and then the last, 18 months, for example, we've had this kind of range between, say, a Hayden Wild, who's now the number one WTC triathlete in the world, and it's Olympic distance, right? And what he's doing is a live low, but a lot of his training is high intensity because that's the nature of his race. So he, his his substrate mix is different that if I compare the kind of 100 mile world, you know, world record holder and Zach Bitter, um, you know, Zach, uh, really, um, he does a lot of just miles in that zone two aerobic space. Um, but like when he, when he said 11 hours, nine for a hundred mile world record on the treadmill, um, he only horrible, went through 13, <laughs> he only went through 13 serves 
of our race plus drink. Um, and if you do the math on that, it's just very little carbohydrate. Mm. Um, so it shows you what's possible. And that's, you know, he's running there sub three hour marathons, four of them back to back, you know, so it's crazy. Yeah. We'll talk to him next tomorrow actually. But what I think is important is that what you're saying is personalized. There is not one size fits all approach. That's why, you know, I'm doing this as a coach. I call it the holistic method that I work on the nutrition and exercise, but also your stress impacts everything and your sleep. If I have a client now who does not sleep at all and she'll be up all night. And so that's going to impact your effort to eat right. Good choices, have energy to exercise, to make good decisions your gut health, digestion, you know, the, and gratitude play and laughter is one of my elements. Cause I think so many people, we get so type A driven, high charging individuals that were so wound up uptight yeah. that we don't know how to chill and relax. And I learned that from personal experience. <laughs> you need to like let loose and have fun, be silly and act like a kid and play, but also have gratitude every day. Yeah. So I think there's so uh, well much said. more to it. Yeah. Well said. So I want to get into your product. So if I'm training low, as we talked with Dan Plews about train low, race high, how do we do that? And how does S fuels help us? Cause it's hard to find fueling for the low carb athlete endurance training and like adjusting those macros based on our intensity and then what get to what we do race day. Yeah. Um, you know, we felt like, uh, as I okay. said earlier, we weren't really bought into kind of some of these, um sorry you're still there yeah i just pulled up your sharing the screen oh, so i just want okay. to share what you're talking yeah, if about you go you're to the, if you go to the the shop there and then go to performance athletes um you'll see that there's a product down there called s fuels train and you know we felt like firstly the output just the nature of training it needs to be very close to water it can't be this like you know thick that's consistent nice. it needs to be yeah that's it there it needs to be much closer to a water-like consistency and what you'll find debbie in um uh, there's the carbohydrate side of the house in terms of sports nutrition industry and then there's this low carb side of the house well we don't use any carbohydrate it's like sub one gram and this it might be depending on one flavor it might be two grams but um the calories that it is in here comes from a uh, medium chain triglyceride and you got to be careful here. Um, and this is where some of my background and Nicole's background came into it. You'll find that it's, it's easy and cheap to, uh, when you do freeze drying of a medium chain triglyceride is to attach it to a maltodextrin. Um, and it's just orthogonal to what you're trying to achieve here. Right. So we, we didn't go down that path. It's absolutely cheap uh, way to do it. If you are hitting, trying to hit a price, go right, go right there. But we fused it with a collagen. And for that reason, you know, collagen is a very uh, low insulinogenic form of protein. Um, in fact, some would say you improve insulin sensitivity. So we fused the medium chain triglyceride with that. And then we added some electrolytes. And you'll find with almost every one of our products, I think all except the bar product, we have a uh, glutamine uh, addition to that and all of that we can talk a lot about that but it's all to do with um, heat triggered uh, distress on the gut membrane uh, through mm-hmm. exercise and yes. what we're trying to do to support that I love that because I've talked about that for a long time and learned that I think when your product came out it's like glutamine and then I got into more health coaching and lab testing and glutamine is so huge for gut health and then how many athletes when we're training in hot weather get leaky gut when you're in hot weather and if you're yeah. doing long training sessions you are going to get leaky gut <laughs> right no, <laughs> like guarantee uh, you have a leaky gut so glutamine is one of the ingredients that i actually always put in a recovery shake for myself and then tell my clients do glutamine and colostrum and but to have that in your training drink is pretty interesting yeah and then you know just on another page here we have our revival our recovery product and we do a really quite clinical high dose of glutamine on that. And uh, we can talk more about that later if you'd like. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's where we start. Um, But again, as you'll see with this, it's like, you know, 60 calories and um, the whole intention there is to really, 
you know, really drive all the enzymes associated with fat oxidation is really to set the body up for that metabolism. So that we're not really trying to just, you go out for a training session, you burn 300 calories. So we're going to give you 300 calories. That's not at mm-hmm. all what we're trying to do with that product. Yeah. So that's if you use that for just a regular training ride when you're doing low heart rate. So people can click on that. So four flavors, everyday cold drink, nutritional ketosis during the day, drinking that and or long, low heart rate intensity. Now, what if you are doing a workout that is going to be more high intensity yeah. interval training, or maybe you're doing uh, like the bike ride I did Saturday is uphill for an hour. <laughs> so yeah, well, there's no low heart rate. That's a great contrast. Um, like, you know, classically for a lot of us athletes um, who have day jobs, right? Yeah. What happens during the week and what happens on a weekend is very different. So during the week, you know, you might have only an hour, hour and a half for, for a session. And what I said earlier was, uh, if you go to our Race Plus product there, um, you should scroll down there. Actually, if you just go to shop and then go to performance app, oh, there it is. If you go to on the left there, race plus drink. Oh, uh, yeah. Back there. Well, I'll find it here for you. Just scroll down here a bit and you'll see there. the race. Middle. You got it in the middle. Yeah. Race plus drink in the middle. Yeah. So um, what I said earlier was, regardless of, you know, whether it's a hour and a half or it's a four hour session, um, that first 30 minutes to an hour. And again, it comes down to uh, your intensity and you can, you can actually get tests done to really understand this, but generally that first 30 minutes to an hour, you should be staying with water or the S fuels train product because Mm -hmm. still at that time, your glute four channels haven't opened up and therefore you are at risk to actually have an insulin response to any form of carbohydrate, whether it's this product or anything else. So regardless, before we get into the race plus product itself, that first 30 minutes to an hour is really just, you know, whether it's water or our train product. So, you know, you're not having any risk to stimulate uh, insulin. Mm -hmm. As you get over through that first hour in the race plus product, it's a mix of, we use a branch cyclic dextrin or a highly branched cyclic dextrin and all that means is you take a starch and you apply an enzyme to it to branch it to break it up Mm -hmm. and the value of that is you know our point of view is when you need a carbohydrate when you really need it i.e high intensity not when you're sitting on the couch when you're in high intensity you don't need it in an hour you need it now right so the reason we chose that, um, it has um, an osmolality, osmolality characteristic that allows it to be very light and it comes through the gut fast. It comes through the stomach very fast. In fact, some of the research on this is like 30% faster than straight glucose. So this is not the product that when you're sitting watching TV yeah. <laughs> to be you know swigging back, um, this is purpose-built for high intensity to get carbohydrate into the system when the glute four channels are open, it's going to come in. It's not needing insulin. It's going to come in and get absorbed in the muscle cell. We still have the medium chain triglycerides in there. The only other thing we add is um, a form of magnesium diglycinate, which is extremely low uh, gut irritation um, as opposed to a lot of your, you know, other forms of magnesium. So, um, that's what we would use in those then high intensity training. And the same applies to racing on race day, Mm -hmm. race day, breakfast, very, you know, low insulinogenic foods. Uh, That first, you know, in triathlon, it's easy to swim. (laughs) You're not taking much anyway. So you have your swim, come out of the water. And really at that point, you're ready to start taking on carbohydrate. The glute four channels are open and you can start using it. Yeah. That's what Dan please has in the endure program, you know, how he uses S fuels, but you know, he eating more of a protein and fat, easy to digest before the race, if you're going to go swim and then you don't, cause if you eat more carbs before then you'll shift to carb as your main fuel source in the beginning. Yeah. We did an actual study. Dan ran in his labs with some of his students where we showed that um, between carbohydrate, protein, and, and fat, you could have some types of protein that would have very little a blunting effect on your fat oxidation, whereas obviously carbohydrate would blunt in that uh, fat oxidation. 
uh, fat, very little response. So, you know, that morning meal on race day, and we've, we've done a lot of shows on our own podcast about this, um, really needs to be of foods that um, are, you know, it, race day morning is not about the morning to be bulking up on calories. That yeah. should have been done the several days prior, but it needs to be of a point where you have satisfaction, you've got sense of fullness, um, and frankly, your cognitive function is turned on. That's really should be the focus of race morning. And you can do that with, you know, a bit of fat, a bit of um, a bit of protein and whether it's coffee, tea or we have a primed product we can talk about also. Yeah. And I know I'm going to run out of time. So we're, I talked too long in the beginning, but the take like the cognition part, does that have like enough MCT oil? Yeah. Like people talk about taking ketones during a bike ride to have more focused cognition for yeah, no, racing. We, if, if you go down just one more down and you'll see on the left-hand side, there's a product called Primed. Um, it's not ketone-based at all. We do have a ketone product. We can talk about it. But the Primed product is an extract from green tea extract. And there's two functions here we use this product for. One is for yeah cognitive improvement. And the other is for further upregulating fat oxidation efficiency. And that is a, a dose-dependent response. And what I mean by that is, you actually don't need a lot of caffeine for an improvement in dopamine sensitivity. And uh, you only need about 0.5 milligrams um, per kilogram body weight, which translates to, in simple terms, a coffee, a cup of coffee, tea, and you're in that space. So that's Mm -hmm. why cognitive wise coffee tea works. The problem of course with coffee and tea is if you don't know really how much you're going to get on the day because of the bean and the the way you you blended it, uh, there's just a 2x difference. What we've done here is a measured dose of caffeine. But then if you want to turn this into an upregulation of fat oxidation, the way that you do that is um, you need to be in the 2.5 to 3 milligrams of caffeine per uh, per kilogram of body weight. Um, and it's at that point that you can get anywhere up to a 25% increase, like upregulation in uh, fat oxidation. Hmm. And we give we give guidance uh, in our guides in terms of how you, yes, how would you yes. do that? Well, you would take a, a half a gram, like one sachet, if you will, if you were a 70 kilogram person, you would take a one sachet before the race starts. And then in your hydration up in the front of your, of your handle on your race bars, uh, you would have another two serves and you'd, you'd take that in over the next, the first hour of the bike, if you will. So you've then got about six hours um, before caffeine has basically like the half-life of caffeine is about six hours. So depending upon the event, half Ironman, you're probably done full Ironman. You could, you could start another cycle of that hundred mile. You've certainly got time for another cycle of that to, you know, keep your um, fat oxidation up regulated. Now, if people are watching the video version, I have your brochure, which is amazing chart. You guys have available on your website. So if you just go to where is it? It was guide. Yeah, right? go to learn, learn and then guides. And then guide. Yeah. And then you can pull up this excellent handout to really walk you through how sure. to, you know, train, fuel train and perform. So I'm just like clicking on here. We talked a little bit about the one to three hour workout, yep. low intensity. And yep. then if you're doing higher intensity or racing, three hour yep. plus, have right. the S fuels race. And then post workout, I think it's important to, I always wait until I, I feel hungry and not eat right away. Cause I'm more sympathetic right away. So, you know, yeah. I don't know if you have guidelines, how long to wait until you have a sh- post-workout drink like this. So this is called revival. Talk a little bit about this before we run out. Of yeah, time. Look, I, it is quite personal that, that piece. Um, but from a pure metabolic perspective, we obviously know that, um, protein resynthesis, um, is higher in that, you know, 30, 60 minutes post, uh, post resistance exercise, post eccentric muscle contraction, the, the inclusion of the high ketone BHBs in this is because, uh, some of the studies that Dan and I looked at, it's, it's nothing to do with performance. Like put it aside, the reason why we're using it is not performance driven. The reason we're using is that, um, there's some really interesting studies that show that, the body will, um, you, you can see the, the biomarkers of uh, muscle cell degradation on leucine levels rising in the blood 
post, um, you know, ex- eccentric muscle contractions. That's classic in running, classic in cycling, etc. Um, and what they, when you, when you add the ketones during the training session, you'll see there's a much more reduced level of that leucine level. And what the studies bring out is that the body preferentially oxidizes the ketones if it's there to be had rather than oxidizing some of the muscle cell tissue uh, during the session. So um, that that's the purpose of the ketone uh, inclusion in the formulation. And then the glutamine, like I said earlier, this is really a clinical dose, five grams. And there's just a ton of research on this, both in chronically ill patients, meaning like bed bound cancer type patients. What mm-hmm. you'll see is a very catabolic state where they're losing body weight and you'll see that they're a highly processing glutamine, uh, you know, very similar in the construct of endurance training where you're essentially in a catabolic state. You are literally burning things up to support those types of training sessions. Um, you know, we, <laughs> this sounds like a sales pitch, but we tell people if it doesn't work, they do your most intense classic hit training session that you typically get some type of delayed onset muscle soreness with. Uh, do it, take note of what happens in the day and the second day after training session. Do it again with the revival product. If it doesn't work, send it back. No problem. But we're pretty guaranteeing that this will work really well for you. Yeah, it's interesting. I know I interviewed HVMN, their ketone IQ, and they're talking about uh, the ketone IQ for post workout recovery. Some yeah, well, we, we do a lot of, I mean, we developed this, of course, for the endurance athlete, but as yeah. we've got into the keto active lifestyle and non-athlete segment um the formulation um it, like it's just getting adopted really well for you know if you will you know just because you're not doing physical exercise you know some original the original reason we created s fuels wasn't actually thinking about the athlete we were thinking about the corporate executive Mm. and they just if you look at what they burn through the options they have to be healthy stay in keto it's really tough for them so yeah the revival product's doing really well in that segment too so i'm gonna have to wrap up because i have uh my 25 year long client i have <laughs> after this can't cool. be late for me i'll get in trouble uh but it's as fuels you can find all this information and learn um and then the post workout, I think is great. I still didn't try that when I was at KetoCon. Three hours to start. So you have all these guidelines. And like the, I like the new products, Keto Cereal and Endurance Bar and how to add that in and the Primed. And yeah, I think we'll talk more to Zach Bitter about how he uses these. And then we'll talk to Dan Plews about the Endure program and how to f- match your fueling and training. So, but for sure, you guys can find this information. I'll put the link in the show notes on the website sfuelsgolonger.com and you hit on learn and you can get these great guides as well as in yeah, no program yeah no thanks debbie for uh having us on if uh if you wanted to go deeper in any of those sections let us know yeah always and i'm sure people have questions but i think it's you know how to become fat adapted and where nutritional ketosis fits in and carb timing strategic carb timing and not all carbs are evil Remember, it's real food sources of carbohydrates, nutrient dense, natural sources, or uh, Mindy Pels always says nature's food. Right. <laughs> so exactly. it's not in a box except for S fuels, the drinks and stuff. I think would be great, but it is hard fueling. I know I stopped racing competitively when I got my adrenal exhaustion in 2013, and nothing was really out there back then. And I was right. trying coconut nut butters and, you know, doing nut packets and, you know, trying to do different fuel sources and it is hard. So it's great to have companies as yours self that you guys are doing the research and really formulating products that can help people train. Yeah. Well, when Dave, fuel. when Dave Scott joined the company, he, he was like, uh, <laughs> he talked about times past where they were taking like figs and yeah. Uh, rice cakes on the on the on the race and yeah, stuff like Mark that. So there wasn't a lot of options available back no, then. No, I didn't race that that far away, but yeah. 2001 to 2012 was my right. Ironman years and yeah, there wasn't that much, but that's how I got into this because I would be trying to do what everyone was telling me back in the beginning and I'd be throwing up the whole time I'm like, okay, yeah. this year I'm going to try exactly. this formula. I'd be throwing up the bike ride the whole time and then I got more information, I think a zone diet and then we started a new leaf metabolic yep. testing cart in 2005 and I'm like, oh, 
you know, how you train. And I did heart rate training when it started with Sally Edwards, who was part of the heart zone training history and created that. And yeah, Barry Seeds was driving a lot of it. Yeah. Uh, Zone diet is where I started figuring out the nutrition and then it started, you know, coming together for myself and being curious, but it was so long ago and so few people as, you know, Maffetone and everybody else out there. So it was great to see where we are today in our industry. All right. Thank you. I'll I'll be in touch and we'll probably have you on again to go a little deeper into the science because people like more of the science. (laughs) All right. All right. Now that you have probably more questions to ask Leighton, but we ran out of time again. I try to keep these podcasts to around an hour and some of you might like a two hour podcast, but I don't have time because I just do this on the side of my full-time job coaching people that this is more for fun and just share this great information with you fellow endurance athletes who are interested in hacking their metabolism, how to improve your training, how to fuel for your sport, how to fuel at rest and improve the aging process. So I do have more information I can share with you on SFuel's website. They do have a great YouTube channel that Dan Plews has lots of videos on there. And just to summarize, the benefits of going longer. Remember, we've talked about this for years. Remember, this podcast has been out for 10 years, originally Fit Fat Fast. So you can go to my website, debbiepotts.net, and get all those free eBooks and go into the archives on the podcast tab and find all sorts of old, older 10-year-old podcasts on metabolic efficiency and eating fat to burn fat because we've talked about this long time. So this is what we've always said. While the body holds only 2,000 calories of glycogen, 40,000 calories of fat are ready and waiting to be used for fuel. Of course, that's not exact for everyone. It's just a template. However, most endurance athletes have trained themselves to first burn sugar for fuel while leaving these fat reserves underutilized. This is on the SFUELS page. I'm reading this to you. So what if we could shift our fat oxidization rate from 0.3 grams of fat per hour to over 1.2 grams per hour? Wouldn't you want to go longer to improve a smoother stream of energy, preserve glycogen levels, to lower requirement of carrying and consuming high amount of carbs, which I don't know about you, I would just throw up the whole time because I ate too much stuff when I first started doing all this in 2001, Reduce risk of sugar crash bonks in high intensity training and racing. Reduce sugar trigger GI and gut distress in training and racing and improved recovery and more consistent training blocks. Now, S Fuels helps us do this with a great source of fuel to add in your training when you're trying to keep your heart rate down low. And then if you're doing high intensity training, you could add in the race fuel. Now, There's four steps and drivers of efficient fat oxidization that they talk about. Step one, lipolysis of the fat cells. Exercise, caffeine, no no to low insulin levels, and fasting. And then step two, transport through blood, endurance exercise, muscle cell transporters. And then we've got step three, transfer into muscle mitochondria. MCT is rapid fuel source, doesn't have to go through the liver. LCT, slower, and then there's exercise. So long train triglycerides. So then we have oxidization of fatty acids. We gotta look out for those adrenal hormones, cortisol, no to low insulin, high fat diet, aerobic exercise. So this is what they're talking about with Endure, Dan Plews, and with S Fuels. This is a simplified view, obviously. There are four key physiological steps in which this leads to oxidization of fat in the muscle cell. Each of these steps have multiple factors which can ramp up, slow down, or shut down this metabolic chain. Clearly, exercise positively affects many of these steps, while conversely, insulin, triggered by simple carbohydrates, blunts several of these steps. Like all physiological processes in the human body, this physiology can be trained and improved for greater efficiency. So in this packet, you can get off SFUELS website. I'll put the link in the show notes, how to get started. 
And this is what you do with a coach. And hopefully that knows how to do fat adaptation and unique you and how to adjust things course correct. Now, this is basic, but just start here. Accelerate your metabolic transition. You'll need to shift from a high carb intake to temporary low intake. You might have already done that. But then we need to work at those external and hidden internal stressors. The next step is a two to four week transition. This is what I talked about in another video I did with Endure IQ female athletes mapping it out. It's going into a cold keto phase. Now you want to do this off season where you don't have any races because you need to decrease your workout load. So it's a temporary shift, 50 grams of carbs today in cold keto, two weeks to four weeks. And women, you're going to do this differently, matching it to your menstrual cycle, optimal days to go lower carb. Now, this will help raise your fat oxidization enzymes and metabolic efficiency. So you're raising that fat consumption and protein and decreasing carbs. Now, you want to, what they talk about, living better. You live lower, maintain a lower carb, higher fat lifestyle, 50 grams to 150 grams of carbs per day once you are fat adapted. And then this is where we do nutrient timing, matching your nutrition, your fueling with your exercise load. So that carb variation is going to be depend on your workouts that day. So if you have a rest day, like mine's Monday is my easy day, I'm going to get those carbs down lower. If I'm doing a double workout that day, I can go 100 to 150 grams of carbs and be okay. So you got to look at it as your performance suffering because you're going too low. And if you're doing a HIIT training versus a low, slow metabolic mafetone type of workout. So then you're racing at a different level. So let's go back to the next one here, training smarter. So you're training fat oxidization. This is where we talk about train low, race high. So optimally, you're training the metabolic systems to efficiently burn fat during longer, slow, low intensity training, kind of the mafetone, or ideally we could all find someone to do a metabolic efficiency testing cart. Panoe, P-N-O-E, is a testing cart slash backpack. You can get this portable and you can actually rent it and get a test. So I actually might look into doing that. They just sent a text message the other day. So training your fat metabolism when you're exercising by doing the low, slow intensity is what I've done since 2005. And you're training through minimal carbs and higher fat and then your protein comes in there at appropriate times. So then we can race faster by using both carbs and fat. Remember, carbs are not evil for the athlete. It's crappy refined sugars and um, processed foods that are crappy for you. So using carbs, real food sources ideally, and healthy fats for fuel. So when we are racing, we can tie in the carbs and fat, access multiple energy substrate sources, including MCT, medium chain and long chain fats and carbohydrates for high intensity training and racing. Now, if you're not racing, you're just doing things for fun and your heart rate's low, you may be okay keeping those carbs low. But if you're hitting it hard and challenging yourself like I like to do in a race, I'm not going to pay as much as races are these days if I'm not in shape and ready to push myself. So hopefully you're racing some of these races and you are going to deplete your muscle glycogen so you can time in that extra carb fuel with something as S fuels to give you that extra push to the finish line. So when we talk about that fat adaptation process, we'll talk about this again, a separate podcast, but it's a two to four, sometimes six week transition diet. If I've had a lot of clients do this with me and they're pretty addicted to sugar. So it takes us a little while. So we start kind of in phase one that Dan Plews talks about in the IQ, just kind of observing. Let's look at and learn your relationships with food, how you eat, when you eat, why you're eating, and just check everything out. I'm just going to just track what you're eating. You're going to log it into chronometer. We're going to see how you feel. How's your poop? How's your energy? How are your workouts? How's your sleep? We're going to just look at that for a couple weeks. And then we're just going to start swapping. Can you do this instead of that? Can you add this in here? And do you really need that right now? Why are you eating? Mindless eating versus mindful eating. Are these the best nutrient-rich, nutrient-dense foods you can choose based on the time of year? Are they in-season foods, real foods? And then we go into the cold keto 
where we do it with your low intensity week. We cut down exercise a ton and go about 50 grams of carbs. So we do that two weeks or so, cold keto they call it. And that's when you're facilitating retraining of your fat oxidization enzymes and physiology by making a temporary shift in your choice and mix of macro food choices. So carbs, fat, and proteins for two to four weeks. So example, carbs are reduced to 50 grams total day. Fats are increased to 65 to 80%. And then the proteins are one to two grams per day per pound per athlete recommendations. So Dr. Gabrielle Leon I think makes it simple. Remember, I've said this before, your ideal body weight in grams of protein per day. Then there's others that say 0.5 to 0.8 grams per pound body weight. And then some of them are lean body mass. So just kind of look at those formulas might vary a little bit. So what are you eating? You're doing non-starchy vegetables and berries when you're doing a cold keto. You're doing lots of creams, butter, nuts, olives, coconut oil, whole fat yogurt, avocado, S fuels train can be used in this period. And then the proteins, fish, eggs, meats, chicken. You know, I'm not a big fan of beans and grains unless they're properly prepared, which is a lot of work. So I just say skip them. But you, if you're going to have beans and legumes and, and grains, you just have to make sure you soak and rinse them and then you are eating them so that you can absorb them. They're not going to cause gut irritation. But S fuels has a revival shake that you can do and s fuels bars that you can fit in here now keep it simple is what s fuels talks about and their products so i do that as well you know eating foods that are easy to make i'm a simple chef my husband's a chef neil does the cooking i just do when i have to cook it's just super easy like ground beef and avocado and olive oil and olives or something so i'll post that on my low carb athlete page on instagram and then lastly, we want to make sure we're having electrolytes, LMNT, I've used Realite, and then S Fuels has a new product that I haven't tried is electrolyte salts and what's called Transform Endurance Supplement. And they have some calories in there and glutamine and natural sweetness. So they use monk fruit, which is great because I can't do stevia. And then they have some other options. They have primed and uh, S Fuels bar and all sorts of things. So check out S Fuels, check out their guide to training. And I'll see if I can put the link in the show notes and how to train fat oxidization. Great tips. And then you can go to the YouTube video that Dr. Dan Plews has and your IQ or S Fuels, how to train that fat oxidization. If you're coming into off season, good time to do this. If you're racing in the fall, just wait till your races are done. But day-to-day training, eating those healthy fats and good quality protein and timing those carbs, but becoming fat adapted. So you're improving that fat burning metabolism, but don't forget, we still need to have some carbs in there after we're fat adapted. So you still need to have metabolic flexibility going both ways. I think we get so driven ambitious that we forget that we still need to metabolize carbs and not just fat. So don't be stuck in nutritional ketosis and doing 50 grams of carbs forever. Cycle them in and out. Real food, still avoid the crap. Maybe once in a while you have a, a cheat day, but you reset it with a, a easy workout day and, and a fast, or you're doing some hit training and some more intervals that day and burn off those extra glycogen stores. So I think you should read all this information. I could go on and on. There's so much in here. There's 30 pages in their manual about how you can train your fat oxidization, low intensity training and timing with that, with fueling and how to race with their higher intensity training using S Fuels Race Plus Fuel and so much information in here that's free. And I've been paying for Endure IQ coaching, their program, which is not for coaches necessarily. It's for you too, who's not a coach, but it gives you lots of information. So let's learn more on S Fuels Go Longer. And for sure, check out our discount code so you can save money on your next order. So check out the show notes, how you can get your S fuels, how to go longer, good time of year to use S fuels train when you're doing the low intensity training 
and maybe work towards fat oxidization. So maybe you're just burning 0.3 grams per hour of fat and you can increase it to 1.2 grams an hour so you can improve that stream of energy coming from fat metabolism and preserve those glycogen levels until you are ready to race. And I know I'm doing some 5K, 10K races this fall to do my speed work. So you might need some of this. So check it out. Let me know if you have questions. If you need help, check out my new client special that's just reviewing what are you doing now? What can we do differently? And I'll assess with nutritional therapy assessment and food log correlated with, as I said before, energy, your poop and your sleep and your exercise. So we kind of correlate that data together and then two coaching calls in that package to review and then go over goals and then meet again, see how you're doing. So go to debbiepotts.net and check out the show notes below for your link discount code on SFuels. Enjoy. Thanks for listening to the Low Carb Athlete Podcast. If you have any questions, feedback, or topic suggestions, let us know on Facebook or at debbiepotts.net. You can help us to continue to grow by leaving a review on iTunes. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.